Well, we greet you this morning. Those of you online, we're glad you've joined us today. We, uh, we're going to sing a song of what day that will be. But I just want to remind you that, uh, that we appreciate each one of you uh, who watches. And if, if you and your family are watching, uh, if you would do this for me, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, tell us how many are watching just for the fun of it. And if you're on, uh, if you're on YouTube, same thing. It would be a big help to us. We're glad you joined us. God bless you. Let's sing. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, and when he takes me by the hand, leads me to the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be, there'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day, that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And when he takes me by the hand, leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day. That will be. We're looking forward to that day when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords will call us back home. Until then, we serve Him because we love Him. We serve Him and we're thankful, aren't we? I'm Amen. just glad. I'm glad. Well, if you have your Bibles, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of the Lord. Today I'll be taught the word of the Lord. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same. And I'll never be the same. I'm about to receive. I'm about to receive. The incorruptible. The incorruptible. The indestructible. Indestructible. The indescribable. Indescribable. The ever living seed, the word of God. And I'll never be the same. And I'll never be the same. Amen. Amen. We're in John's gospel this morning. It, I, my title would be Believing Without Seeing. That's fun, isn't it? Believing without seeing. It, it kind of fits who we are today as well. And we start at John chapter 4. We're going to begin with verse 46. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Galilee and, uh, Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him, to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Jesus then said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And he went his way, and he was now going down his... As he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Verse 52, He then inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour when Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and, don't you love this, his whole household. I like that, 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 that the whole family was changed as well as the father. So I want to take a look at some of the great events in, 
in the life of Jesus' ministry, uh, make application of where we fit in the story. I want to look at the healing to the nobleman's son because it's so cool. It's there's a lot of things we take by faith. I mentioned this the other day. Uh, when we sit in a chair, we have faith that things are going to hold us up. One of my one of my good friends uh, from Colorado, uh, we went to Bible college together, and he pastored a small church in Oklahoma. And I'm not going to say the town, nor am I going to give his name. Perhaps you might know him, but I'll just say this: he was a tall guy. And they visited our home one Sunday, and after lunch he sat in my favorite little rocker chair. And he sat in it and leaned way back, and the back snapped off. So I want to lay the foundation for this. The church he pastored in Oklahoma, on the platform had wooden folding chairs. He probably should have <coughs> tested the chairs out before, but that Sunday morning, after they got done with Sunday school, he made his way up to the platform and sat on the chair, and the chair promptly collapsed. Day. Now, understand, in faith, he sat in that chair thinking it would hold him up. Uh, I will say this. His wife, sitting over on the front row, fell apart with laughter. No one else in the whole congregation acted like anything had happened. So I would just say this. It, he probably didn't lay that one down uh, <laughs> very fast. Uh, sometimes our faith is misplaced like that folding chair. Uh, I was thinking about the Grand Canyon. Before I saw the Grand Canyon, I had in faith believed that there was this beautiful place called the Grand Canyon. But in 1984, we went to General Assembly and drove and got to see part of it. We didn't get to see the whole thing, obviously. But we got to see enough of it to know that it is real. Uh, most of you, probably many of you have been to the Grand Canyon. I had never been. Pikes Peak is another place. Oh, every every... Every morning of my life, when I worked for Hill Packard, I would drive down Guard of the Gods Road, and there would be this beautiful panoram panoramic picture of, of Pikes Peak, sometimes clothed with clouds, and sometimes covered with white snow, and sometimes just the bare mountain standing there so majestically, we saw that. But before I saw it, in faith I believe it was there, because I'd heard it, and I'd seen pictures of it. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, how, how many of you have been to Egypt and saw the pyramids? I have never. I've seen pictures of it. I have actually now seen videos of it, of course, as you know. Uh, but I've never in person been there. The, the, the Sistine Chapel is another place in Rome. Uh, I'd love to see that. I've not seen it, but I have friends who've been there. And in faith, I believe it's there. And so when we talk about spiritual things, this nobleman's a unique guy. In John chapter 46, Jesus had been to Cana earlier. That's where he did the, the miracle of turning the water into wine. They were at a marriage feast, and they were out of wine. And Jesus' mother said, could you make, I'm not sure what she said. Could you, could you, we need some more here. Uh, you know, we're going to look bad. I don't know what she said, but all I know is, the Bible said, he said, go get some water pots, fill them up. And people marveled that they saved the best for last. Amen. Jesus was there. And, and he did this awesome miracle for them. They remembered that. And now he's back in Cana, and, and he's speaking to a crowd in, in, in verse 45. Uh, he, came, he came to Galilee. The Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So verse 46, then he came to Cana of Galilee. So the word had got out that Jesus had come back to town. And the nobleman, I'm not sure where he was, but he heard Jesus was in town, and the Bible said, as Jesus is speaking to the crowd, he interrupts him. Um, generally, we don't have people ask questions when I'm preaching. I have a couple times. Uh, in Oklahoma, I had a young man ask me a question. I said, we can hang that on the hook. See me after the service, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. But generally, when you're preaching, the crowd doesn't ask questions unless we say, hey, Roger, would you, would you like to say something? Or, or we ask people to, to share. Generally, when the pastor's speaking, he preaches, gets done. So Jesus is speaking, and this man interrupts him. And he says, he says sir, and, and, and I thought, who is this guy? This is a nobleman. Who is he? He's a high-ranking official. He's a royal officer who served under King Herod. This guy's got clout. And, and so I'm sure he's dressed in uniform, wouldn't you think? And he comes and says, excuse me, excuse me, i, I got to talk to you. you. Can you imagine the disciples? These are the same disciples that when 
when Jesus uh, was, was speaking and they brought children to be blessed by Jesus, he, they said, no, 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 he's too busy. He's doing important stuff. <laughs> uh, or, or the woman with the issue of blood who would, who would have to come through the crowd shouting unclean, and she touches the hem of his garment, and he says, who touched me? This man is a, is a man of power, a man of prestige, a man of great means and influence, but he had a problem. And I thought about this because um, if he's working for King Herod, he's probably not one of those who really thinks Jesus is the greatest. But somehow, he knows Jesus has power. And his son is sick and dying. And he's gone to the best physicians and no one's able to help him. And there's nothing they can do for him. And he's exhausted all of his resources. Nothing to do. And his beloved son is dying. And, 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 and he's beside himself. And, and then he hears that Jesus has come to town. He'd been sitting by the bedside of his son who's languishing and getting worse and worse and unless there's a miracle, he's not going to survive. And, and I, I thought about this. Up until this time, he may not have ever experienced what it was like to be helpless and in need with no one to help. But he heard, the Bible said, verse, verse uh, 47, he heard. And I thought about this. He had heard about Jesus. He had heard how Jesus healed the sick and the lame and raised the dead. He had heard about Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord. No, he didn't know about that, did he? You see, we know about the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He knew about a man who could come and do something for you. And maybe he'd even heard the story of the woman at the well who said, Come, see a man who told me all about me. All I know is that, that he was there and he heard about Jesus. He lived in Capernaum. That's 20 miles from where Jesus is preaching. Jesus had stayed there. He had performed a miracle in chapter 2, verse 12. The miracle of, of the water and the wine. And, 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 and maybe he had heard about Jesus, or maybe he would even seen him there. I don't know. But he interrupts Jesus, and he's made this trip to find Jesus. And, and he interrupts him, and he begs him, says, please, please, you've got to stop what you're doing. Come with me and, and, and touch my son. He's not going to live if you don't help him. Please help. Be Listen, he's begging him. He's not saying, uh, sir, would you, uh, could you take a few moments and go with me? Now, he had authority. He probably could have commanded Jesus, you think? But, but, and, and I thought, what, what about this crowd? I don't know how many people were there, but there's a crowd there. And they're going, how dare he come and do this? A nobleman. Now, Jesus, you've got to get the picture, is a Jewish rabbi teacher, carpenter. By the way, Jesus didn't fit the, 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 uh, the picture of, of a rabbi, but they called him teacher. And, and here's a rich, influential man, powerful, on his knees, begging Jesus to stop in the middle of his sermon and go with him to Capernaum to touch his son. Now, I want you to catch a couple things. One, trouble led this nobleman to Jesus. You notice it doesn't say his name, it just says he was a nobleman. I think that's kind of cool, don't you? We don't have to know his name. We just have to know that God listens to the need of those who cry out. He tried everything else. Nothing worked. Now he's going to try Jesus as his last resort. He's traveled 20 miles, probably by horseback. I'm sure he had other people with him, maybe other soldiers. I don't know. But he gets there. And I just thought about this. Sometimes, listen, sometimes our troubles and our trials and our situations bring us to Jesus. Sometimes they do. And, and, and if it hadn't been for this, this terminal illness that his son had, are you ready for this? He may never have come to Jesus, nor had his family convert. And I just want you to keep in mind, sometimes God allows things that aren't good to bring us to a situation where we need him, and we come to him, and he answers our prayer. Amen? Amen. Trouble led him to Jesus. And I, and I like that. And, and, and so something drastic in his life, something drastic sometimes happens in our lives, and we're so desperate, we say, God, if you do, I will. No one else to turn to. He's sitting by the bed. There's no, he hasn't happened. There's no alternatives. You know, a lot of times we have choices, but this is no alternative situation. Sitting by the, by the bedside of his son, watching him get worse and worse, and the fever taking his life, and there's no hope for him, and there's no help for him, and, 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 and then he hears. Somebody said, hey, you know that Jesus that was here a few months ago or a short time ago? He's down there in Capernaum. You've got to go down there. 
grabs his horses, calls a few guys together, and they ride like the wind, and they get there, and Jesus is in the middle of church, middle of the service. Can you imagine somebody come walking in, hey, could you stop what you're doing and go pray for my son or heal my son? Touch him. I need help. Ah. Secondly, and I thought this is important for us to learn. This is a lesson we can learn. Personally, he went to Jesus. He didn't go through it the preacher. Hey, pastor, could you uh, give a good word? I, <laughs> I've got a habit of time to or something say, hey, would you speak a good word for me? No, you pray yourself. I I'll pray for you, but pray for yourself. You've you got to do it personally. Personally, here's an, he's a nobleman. He could have sent his servants to come to Jesus and say, hey, you've got to come with us. we got so-and-so, and, and he's got a son in trouble. No, this was, such a, this was such a personal thing to him. He went on his own. He came to Jesus. It mattered to him that much. And, and I want you to understand this. We can have people praying for us, but the bottom line is sometimes we have to go to Jesus. By the way, he doesn't always answer the way we expect him to either, does he? Right. I've learned that one. I'm not, I'm, I can't tell you that I'm always happy about how he answers prayer. Because he does it the way he sees best to do it. We always, and, and by the way, I tell you that we always like to give God our recipe. God, here's how I want you to do it. Part of the, understand this, we're not doing this out of selfishness. We're doing this because we're in this small picture. We see this much of the picture, not the whole thing. And so from our picture, God, if you would heal them, if you would restore them, if you bring them back to us, that's what we need. And he doesn't always do it that way. Right. Uh, going to have a discussion probably when I get to heaven and ask him, how come? Uh, may not, because I may already have the answer when I get there. But, but I'm just thinking, those are things that come to mind, right? So, so intercessory prayer is good. When I'm praying, when we do the, the uh, family altar around here, and we make intercession for other people, that's what we're doing when we're praying for them. We're interceding for them, standing in the gap for them, but that doesn't always work as well as them going to Jesus and saying, I have need. Can you help me? Amen. So Jesus wants us to come personally to him when we have a need. So I, I hope you get that personally, not with a prayer request, not with somebody else covering you in prayer. We want them to do that. And if you're out there on, 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 online, folks, we pray for one another. If you have a request, we want to pray for them. But the bottom line is that sometimes we have to go personally to Jesus and say, I have no other way to go or place to go. Please help us or help me. Amen. Now there's a passage in Galatians 6 2 that says this. Bear one another's burdens. Don't you like that one? So, so it is our responsibility to pray for one another. We have several people that have been exposed to COVID recently. We pray for them. Lord, protect them. God has. And yet our friend Larry uh, has had COVID twice down in Texas. Maybe Texas is a good place to catch COVID. I don't know. But, uh, but uh, Jordan's dad, Larry, got COVID. Bear one another's burdens. We're interceding for him now. We're praying for him. That God would touch him. And uh, uh, I just thought, you know, God personally, sometimes he requires this personal prayer. Sometimes it requires us personally getting involved in this, not having someone else do it. And I, I thought one of the things that caught my attention was this. He asked for mercy. Don't you like that one? He asked for mercy. Have mercy on us. Help us. Can you help us? He, he didn't appeal to Jesus because he was somebody. Um, I thought about this too, because Jesus kind of was not known. I mean, he was known to do all this stuff, but but he we would we would see him today. We think he might have a leather jacket on. Maybe he'd ride a Har Harley. <laughs> he didn't do things the way normal people did. He didn't wear. Uh, probably today, you might not see Jesus in a in a tie. I'm wearing a tie today. Uh, you might not see Jesus that way. Uh, he didn't fit the status quo of the religious leaders of that day. And, and, and I, I thought, you know, that's not what we need. We just need the contact with him. Uh, Jesus was not a rich nobleman. Jesus wasn't a powerful, he was powerful with, with, with the relationship with the Father, but the bottom line was he wasn't powerful like we think powerful. He wasn't powerful in status. Uh, you didn't go say, wow, you know, oh, I, we need to salute, you know. Not that kind of thing. He didn't ask Jesus to bless him because of what he had. I thought about this too. This, this nobleman set aside all that he had when he went to Jesus. He, he, he set aside the fact that he had power. Uh, he set aside everything he had. He said, Lord, I need you. I need you to come with me and touch my son. He went to Jesus and, get this, a humble spirit because he had a need. And uh, 
we, we can't go to Jesus and say, I need you to do this because I deserve it. I've been good. <laughs> hey, Dad, uh, I've been doing all the things you asked me to do, and I've got all my chores caught up. Will you do this for me? It wasn't that way. This is the man who had nothing. He had all this stuff, but he had nothing when he came to Jesus. Help me. Can you help me? Can you touch my son? Can you come with me now? Came in a humble spirit. Don't you like that? Amen. So we can't go to Jesus and go, well, you know, Jesus... I've been paying my tithe, and it's caught up. And in fact, I'm ahead. I'm going to church every time the doors are open. I read my Bible. I'm a good person. I try to give a Christian life. I try to tell them you about you, Lord. I, it's payback time. <laughs> it's payback, please. You owe me. <laughs> I've been doing all the stuff you asked me to do. You kind of owe me, God. The nobleman appeals to the grace and mercy of Jesus. Not to any merit that he might have had. I like that, don't you? When we come to God, we don't have anything to bring to him. I was thinking of that little drummer boy in the, in the Christmas stories, you know, and he says he's got nothing but to play the drum. We have nothing when we come to Jesus, honestly. Uh, one of the most scary things about, about dying is the fact that no matter how good we've been here or how we've tried on this side, we have nothing that deserve, that, that gives us the right or reservations to get into heaven other than the forgiveness of the Son, Jesus, and the blood that he shed for us. That's the only thing we have. And uh, so we don't deserve anything. Listen, we don't deserve anything from Jesus except hell, when you really think about it. We were sinners saved by grace. We're condemned to a devil's hell. Because Adam sinned the Adamic sin, we, are, we have that curse of sin on us. And it said death, and there are two deaths, physical and spiritual, and that's on us unless we have a relationship with God that heals it. We still have physical death, but then the spiritual death is set aside. We, we spend eternity with God. By the way, spiritual death doesn't mean you cease to exist. Spiritual death means this. If I don't get to heaven, if God is not forgiven my sin, and when I die, if it's not all right, I will spend eternity in a devil's hell in torment. That's what the Bible says. It's not what Mike says. be nice if it didn't work that way, wouldn't it? When someone jokes and says, you know, I'm going to hell, I'm going to party with all my friends, excuse me, you haven't read the scriptures. And, and, and I read the scriptures. This doesn't sound like a party time. This says weeping and gnashing of teeth. This talks about torment and awful things. It's because of grace and mercy that we have the right to come to God. Now, something else I got out of this, too, that I thought was quite interesting was he wanted Jesus to go with him to Capernaum. If you go, you can touch him. He'll be okay because all the people you've touched, please do that. And, and, and I want you to get this. In his mind, the only way that Jesus could do anything was if he personally went there. Folks, that's how we work. That's how my mind will work too. Hey, come with me. I've got to take you here. You've got to do this. Please, please. And, 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 and these, it was interesting because Jesus needed to be at the bedside of the son, yes, And yet Jesus was in the middle of ministry where he was. And, and what he thought was the only way Jesus could do the miracle was if he were there where he needed to be. Right? Right. The lesson, I want you to get this. We can't tell Jesus how we want him to answer prayer. I do. We do this, folks. Now we do, and like I said earlier, we, we, we do this. We don't do this maliciously. We do this because it's the only picture we see. Uh, if we have a need, we go to Jesus. We tell him our need, and then we tell him how to do it. <laughs> don't you love that? We do. Here's how I want you to do this, God. Uh, the Lord might say, hey, let me do this. I know how to do it better. But we tell him that without realizing it, and, and we've messed up. Sometimes, I, I, want you, I want you to get this. I think sometimes we limit Jesus and what he could do because we tie his hands with the picture we paint for him and how we want to do it. We're dictating to him how to act, telling him what to do, and sometimes how to do it. Jesus might have something else in mind. This day, Jesus has something else in mind. Don't you like that? Yeah. There's a passage in Ephesians chapter uh, 3, verse 20, and it says, Unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Jesus, I want you to get this. Jesus can do way beyond what we can understand, what our mind can conceive. Uh, sometimes we limit God. Uh, if we are God's children, I just want you to ponder this. If we are God's children, 
if if your dad, if your dad, most of you, if your dad was alive and he he was trying to help you, he would say, anything I've got is yours. Right. And I'll do for you. And I want you to get this picture then. Then here's the Heavenly Father who, who created it all and he said, what I have is yours. I'll get you through this. I'll, I'll make a way for you. Uh, for, for some fathers, it would be our sacrifice for you. But, but fathers make a way. Our Heavenly Father has power to make a way for us. Don't you like that? Hallelujah. I just like that. Jesus spoke to the crowd. And, and he spoke in plural in the Greek. And, and he talked to the crowd. And everything, everything stopped for just a moment because the nobleman interrupts what Jesus is saying. <laughs> and when a nobleman asked Jesus to do a miracle, the crowd wanted to see what Jesus is going to What's he going to do? I mean, this guy's got clout. And he's come here, and he's saying, hey, here's what I want you to do, Jesus. Please come with me right now. You've got to come and touch my son. You know what the Bible says? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's powerful. Hebrews chapter 1, verse, or 11, verse 1. Uh, it, it, it's, it's this thing called faith. The people who were there in the crowd, do you think they had faith for Jesus to heal that guy's son? No. They didn't have a clue. What about that father? Jesus said, uh, I've got this. Take, uh, just hang on. <laughs> he didn't say it that way, but that's, today is how you say, hang on a minute. Here. 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Folks, I want to tell you something. It's hard to walk by faith because we're sight creatures. Jesus turns away from the nobleman to talk to the crowd. And the nobleman redirects Jesus and says, hey, wait, wait, wait. I don't care about their need to see a sign or a miracle because Jesus said, y'all are here to see signs and miracles. All I care about is my son is sick. He's dying. I don't need you to preach a sermon to them. I need a miracle now. I need it right now, soon. And, and uh, what I like about this guy, and, and every time Jesus did a miracle, every time someone came and begged him for something, he did a couple things. One, he'd say, what do you want to the blind guy I want to see? How about the woman with the issue of blood? Who touched me? The disciples said, you're being bumped and jostled? Are you serious? No, this is different. The woman who should have been shouting unclean stands up. Now, I've told you this before, if you've heard me preach about this story. She dove through the crowd. My story is she dove through the crowd in the dust and touched the tassels on the bottom of his garment. Didn't touch him. And she's healed right there on the spot. Amen. Didn't say a word. Her faith had healed her. And as she touches him, Jesus said, wait a minute, whoa, 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 somebody touched me. Are you kidding me? There's all these people out here. What do you mean somebody touched you? This was different. And she stands up. And she says, me. And out of that, Jesus says, your faith has healed you. You're, you're, you're okay. It's okay. Right. And so here's this guy. He dives, through, he dives through the crowd, so to speak. And I thought about this. When he had faith, he, he'd heard about Jesus' miracles. But, but, but when he heard that Jesus was going to be in, in this town 20 miles away, this spark began to grow. i got to go. i got to go. I think he can do something that nobody else can do. And he gets there with Jesus, and there's Jesus in the crowd. And he says, can you touch my son? And, and that little spark goes to a flame. And he doesn't give up. And I want to tell you something. Sometimes we quit too soon. Thomas left the party too soon. We quit and give up before God has a chance to answer the prayer. So verse 50, Jesus kind of denied the first request to go to Capernaum with him. Jesus said, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not going with you. <laughs> Jesus has something better in mind. He's going to heal the son without laying hands on him. That's pretty cool, don't you think? Yes. I thought about how many times down through the years have we heard missionaries tell stories how they were surrounded by the enemy and God sent angels with flaming swords to protect them. I heard of a missionary one time, they were driving in a place and they were told, be very careful, you're driving at night, there are bandits out there, they will try to kill you. And said as they drove through this, this area, machine guns fired and bullets put holes in their car. When they got to the destination, they realized that there was a hole on this side of the car and an exit on this side where they were sitting, but they weren't touched. And I just want you to understand, God can change things we can't change. But that meant someone was making intercession for them for protection. And later on they would find that out, that somebody was praying for them at that time. 
So Jesus said, I'm not going with you. I, I've got a plan. And it reminds me of, of Lazarus because the Bible says Lazarus died. Uh, they had sent word to Jesus, come, and, come quickly. Our brother's sick. He's four days away. And, and, and please hurry and get here. The Bible said Jesus waited. And, and of course, Mary and Martha are on pins and needles. Their brother's getting sicker and sicker. And pretty soon he dies and he's buried and he's in the grave. And it's four days before Jesus gets there. Jesus said no to him. And I thought about this. And th their response to him was, if you had been here, he would live. Always on time, Jesus says. Amen. Amen. Lazarus died. And Jesus didn't grant the request the way they wanted. And, and they wanted Jesus to come right then. But Jesus had something better in mind. He wanted to call Lazarus out of the grave. <laughs> I, I, Richard, I was just thinking of some things I could think of. You know, because maybe they were... Maybe, maybe he needed rest from the sisters. <laughs> they were chatting. I don't know. Uh, just something that came to mind was, was that. But whatever it was, he had four days, four days to rest, just a tad, you know. Uh, maybe he didn't have time. Maybe he didn't even realize the time. But I just thought about this. When Jesus says no, sometimes when he says no, he has something better in mind for us. And it's not what we expected. We don't expect Jesus to say, okay, I got this. You go, he's healed. And when Jesus says no, it doesn't mean he doesn't know what he's doing or you're not important enough to get the answer. It may be he's got something way better for you. And so we, something that I thought, that this fire went from a, from a spark to a flame to, to a, a, a hot fire. He went his way. This man, when Jesus said, look, he's healed okay right now. The Bible says the nobleman went his way. And he heads home. That's a, it's, a, it's 20 miles. It's, it's a pretty good journey. He, he goes home. And, and he heads the way. And, and the, I read that passage said said that as, as, as they inquire of the servants, at the very time when Jesus said, your son is healed, he was healed. Don't you like that? The more we obey Jesus, the stronger our faith becomes. I like that. If he hadn't left, if he had stayed to beg, I, and I, I'm not going to tell you what would have happened, but if he had stayed there and begged and, 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 and hounded Jesus, it would have shown that he didn't believe Jesus was able to heal him. So he leaves, he heads home, and he had the faith to do what Jesus said, and, and he had faith to believe that, that because Jesus had done it before, he could keep his word. Now I want you to get this, before he believed, because he had heard reports of Jesus from others, now he believes are you ready for this? Because he heard Jesus' own words. Your son is okay. He's restored. Come, my child is dying. And, and Jesus said, uh, said, go your way, your son lives. I just like that. It's okay, I've got this. Your son lives. The exact same time when he heads to Cana, and he inquires of his servants, your son lives. I don't know about you, but I, I get chili bumps <laughs> just thinking of it. Exactly what Jesus said happened. Now, are you ready for this? He got more than he bargained. More than he bargained for. The nobleman said, he began to mend, the fever left him. The nobleman was expecting his son to gradually get better and live, but he instantly healed him on the spot. Hallelujah. That's awesome. Hallelujah. Fully healed, not partly healed. Not, oh, you're going to get better in six months from now, you'll be back on your feet. No, instantaneously restored him. I like that. So when we, sometimes I think when we stop trying to tell Jesus what to do, he does much more than we ask of him. Now, the other thing I thought was this nobleman, you know, when he came down 20 miles, he rode fast on his horse. Going home, he stopped. He was at peace. Maybe, maybe other than what Jesus said to him, maybe he heard a piece of the sermon too. I don't know. All I know is that he believed Jesus. He leaves with peace. And in this 20-mile 20, 20 journey, Jesus healed the boy at 1 p.m. The nobleman could have made it home by dark. Now, get this. He probably was tired from the trip down there. And he thought, man, I just need to stop. So he stopped somewhere. Uh, he didn't need to hurry. His son was going to be okay. I kind of like that, don't you? Amen. I've got, he, I, I've got confidence in, 
and this one who said he was okay. So, so his son's going to be okay. When you pray and give your need to Jesus, are you ready for this one? Write this down. Rest in his promises. Trust him. Jesus promised that his son would be okay. He had peace about it. Now one, I think he looked in the eyes of Jesus. Jesus looked in his eyes too. So when we pray and pray and pray and worry and worry, sometimes it's because we haven't turned loose and let God. Jesus had it. I like that. He had it. He had to take care of it. So when the nobleman goes away, he goes away with peace in his heart. Jesus gave him confirmation. So when you pray, you can stop asking when you see the answer to your prayer. Uh, I've been thinking about, you know, we, we pray for Phyllis's dad, Joe. And we pray for him that God would touch him. We pray that God would, uh, would save him, but also touch him physically. And, and we're hearing some of our prayers answered, but he still hasn't asked Jesus into his life. We need that to happen. So we'll keep praying till we hear that. But we know that in faith, believing God's got this, and we trust him for it. The result of the nobleman's encounter with Jesus, first of all, he grew, his faith grew from a spark to a flame, to a fire, to an inferno, because Jesus had done a miracle in his life. By the way, do we all need miracles in order for us to trust Jesus? No. But it sure helps once in a while, doesn't it? It does. Jesus performed a physical miracle, but then he did something even better. He did a spiritual miracle. The Bible says his house believed. His family believed. His, probably his wife believed and his children. They had not been reared under that, but they found a relationship with God, and they believe. I like that. Amen. What started out as the healing or giving of a spiritual life or extension of a spiritual life turned into, are you ready for this, from physical to eternal life. Touched by the Lord. Radically revolutionized. You think he ever could be the same again? He was a nobleman. He still was. But his life and his focus and his spiritual journey was totally day and night different. And, and, and when he returned home, I, I think he probably told everybody he could come in. You're not going to believe what happened. But you know this Jesus guy? Yeah. Well, I heard he was in Capernaum. And, and, and I drove down there. I rode down there. Drove down there. I rode down there. And I got there. And I begged him to touch my son who was dying. There was no hope. The doctors couldn't do anything for him. And he said, it's okay. I got this. He said, at the same time he said it, my son was healed, and my family will never, ever be the same. Everyone in the household, uh, in the Greek that includes his family, are you ready for this? In the Greek it includes his family, his servants, his hired help, anyone who had contact with him was converted because Jesus touched his son. All affected by this man's faith. I want you to get this. When you have faith that follows the Lord... There are a multitude of people who will be impacted by your faith. You may not know whose lives has been changed, but God knows how to do this. So if you're saved, Jesus performed a miracle in your life. If you're born, if you ask God to forgive your sin, that miracle, no different than the man some men say, your heart has been changed, you are God's child, and there's been a miracle in your life. The noble man was excited. I'll tell you something. I'll bet he couldn't keep his mouth shut about it, could he? I'll bet he bragged about that more than he did his new camel that he rode around probably, or whatever, you know, today it'd be the car. Jesus shows us, listen, I want you to, a couple things he showed us uh, as I close. One, he's omniscient. He knew where the nobleman lived. Without, he didn't even have to get the kid's name, right? You don't hear, the, the, the boy's name is not spoken. The man's name is never spoken. God, who is omniscient, knew where he lived without ever going to the house. He knew the man's heart through a little faith, and he used the faith he had. He was omnipresent. Jesus didn't need to come home with him. He knows our needs. I want you to get this. He knows your needs today. He knows what you need. He knows what you, what you have. He knows the amount of faith you have. He's got this. He's omnipresent, and he's omnipotent. Amen. There's nothing Jesus can't do to meet our need. This man needed a miracle, folks. Nothing else had worked. He did everything he could. Everything he could in his power. Sometimes, folks, we do everything we know how to do, and it's not enough. And we come to the Creator, and we say, Here I am. I have nothing to bring to you, but please help me. He answers that prayer. Aren't you glad? Amen. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have had those kind of great miracles happen. Many of us have seen those kind of miracles. But not every day. 
maybe a few in a lifetime we've seen, and I'm not going to say it's faith or not faith, but I think part of it is our society has learned to depend on itself instead of God. So my challenge today is, as we journey closer towards Easter, let's take and focus on where our faith is. This guy didn't see, but he believed. God answered his prayer. His family would never be the same. And so for us today, my challenge to you is this, that, that we have such a radical transformation in our lives that others who know us will want to know what happened. That, that, that our lives change. By the way, I want to tell you something. If you ask God to forgive you, your heart changes, your thought process changes, the process changes. The things that are valuable to, in, in the past change because He has called you to follow Him. So we're going to pray. And as we pray this morning, I want to challenge you to, to look in deeply in your heart. God, if I have need here, help me. If my faith is weak, draw me closer to you. Help me to trust you more. If I've never asked you to forgive me from my sin, I want to be ready to go to heaven, Lord. Forgive my sin. Right now, I'm a sinner. And, and I ask you to forgive my sin. Come into my life. I accept you. Forgive everything. And make me new. And write my name in your Lamb's Book of Life. And then we thank him for it. Yes, Jesus. And we tell somebody. Father, we bow before you today. We thank you, Lord, that there was a man who had enough faith that he traveled 20 miles because he loved his son so much to seek this one we call Messiah. And to ask him, to beg him, to implore him, to heal his son, to come with him. But Jesus said, your son is okay. He's restored. This morning, Lord, we pray you would touch us. We come to you with the best faith we've got. We ask, Lord, you look at our heart of hearts, and Lord, if there be any need in us, draw us to you. Forgive us if we need forgiving. If we need more faith, Lord, we pray you draw us and strengthen us and encourage us and nourish us, Lord. Father, we pray that you'll help us to touch other lives because of the story you give to us to tell. In Jesus' name. Now may the God of peace fill you. And may your faith grow to the point that when he says, I got this, we say thank you. And we move on and trust him. I love you. We'll see you next Sunday morning. God bless you. Peace, Pastor. Amen.